Hello and welcome to our plain language and readability lesson. My name is Jessica Bolak frank and I am the program coordinator here at the Center for Access to Justice and Technology at Chicago Kent. On our agenda today, we have an introduction to plain language, the definition of plain language, the history of the plain language movement, some statistics, steps to plain language and readability, and a couple practice exercises. For an introduction to plain language, we look to the Northwest Literary Council's Plain Language Handbook, right for your reader. The Literary Council is a Canadian organization that works with individuals and groups to promote and support literacy and other essential skills. They develop this plain language handbook as a guide as you write for your readers. Plain language means that you think about your readers and pay attention to, first, how you organize the information. That means you tell your readers what the document is about. You help them find the information they need. You pay attention to what you write. You include only the information your readers really need. You pay attention to how you write. You use words and grammar your readers understand. You speak directly to your reader. And finally, you think about how you present the information. You use design techniques to help people read more easily. They also found that there were two myths about the plain language movement. First, that plain language is simple-minded and talks down to people, when in fact, plain language includes and respects people. People understand what they read. They get the information they need and not a lot of extras. The second myth was that plain language isn't necessary for people who read well, when in fact, plain language helps everyone understand what they read. People with good literary skills still skip over information, understand less, or just won't read a document that is too complex, wordy, or technical. Professor Eagleson from the University of Sydney has directed numerous projects for private and government organizations to rewrite documents in plain English. He defined plain English as clear, straightforward expression using only as many words as are necessary. It is language that avoids obscurity, inflated vocabulary, and convoluted sentence construction. It is not baby talk, nor is it a simplified version of the English language. Writers of plain English let their audience concentrate on the message instead of being distracted by complicated language and they make sure that their audience understands the message easily. In the 1990s, the Clinton administration was determined to make the government more responsive, accessible, and understandable in its communications with the public. Because of that, they dictated that the federal government's writings must be in plain language. By using plain language, we send a clear message about what the government is doing, what it requires, and what services it offers. The Clinton administration defined plain language as documents that have logical organization, are easy to read with design features, and use common everyday words, except for necessary technical terms, that use you and other pronouns, the active voice, and contain short sentences. In 2010, President Obama signed the Plain Writing Act. Its purpose was to improve the effectiveness and accountability of federal agencies to the public by promoting clear government communication that the public can understand and use. It required federal agencies to use plain language in every cover document of the agency that the agency issues or substantially revises. Let's watch a short clip from ABC News marking the announcement. Something Republicans and Democrats can both agree on, the need for government documents to make some sort of sense. If you've ever tried to fill out an income tax return, you know how confusing federal documents can be. So Congress has now stepped in, and our John Berman, quite literally, has both sides of the story. The aquatic vertebrate propels forward, manipulating its complex musculature. In other words, the fish is swimming. Yes, there is something to be said for simplicity even in Washington. So last week, President Obama signed the Plain Writing Act of 2010. The idea is that government documents should be written in clear, understandable language. It's been a problem since the time of the honeymooners. And who willfully fails to pay such estimated tax or tax 
make such return, keep such records, or supply such information. Boy, Ralph, it sounds like you are in trouble. <laughs> trouble? I don't even know what I'm talking about! <laughs> what will the new law mean for you? A Medicare letter that used to say, investigators at the contractor will review the facts in your case and decide the most appropriate course of action, so on and so forth. If the practice continues, the contractor may conduct special audits of the provider's medical records. Now it reads, we will find out if it was an error or fraud. 53 words to 11. A win for those against wordiness. John Berman, on behalf of my employer, the American Broadcasting Company, which is the division of the Walt Disney Company, signing off from the west side of 66th Street in the borough of Manhattan. In other words, John Berman, ABC News, New York. The cry for plain language has even arisen in court opinions. A bankruptcy judge in Texas denied the defendant's motion because, quote, the court cannot determine the substance, if any, of the defendant's legal argument, nor can the court even ascertain the relief the defendant is requesting. The defendant's motion is accordingly denied for being incomprehensible. The judge then quoted this famous scene from Billy Madison in his footnote. What you just said is one of the most insanely idiotic things I have ever heard. At no point in your rambling, incoherent response were you even close to anything that could be considered a rational thought. Everyone in this room is now dumber for having listened to it. I award you no points, and may God have mercy on your soul. In 2002, the National Center for Education Statistics completed a five-year, $14 million study. This was the most comprehensive study of literacy ever commissioned by the U.S. government. Over 90,000 adults were interviewed, and the National Center found that nearly 50% of adults are functionally illiterate. That means they cannot balance their checkbook, they cannot read a drug label, and they cannot write an essay for a job. 21 to 23% of adults were not able to locate information in text, could not make low-level inferences using printed materials, and were unable to integrate easily identifiable pieces of information. 41 to 44 percent of those U.S. adults with the lowest level of literacy were living in poverty. The study also showed that more than 20 percent of adults read at or below a fifth grade reading level. That is far below the level needed to earn a living wage. 21 million Americans cannot read at all. 45 million are marginally illiterate, one in five high school graduates cannot read their diploma, and they noted that there are almost 750,000 words in the English language, but one-third of all of our writing is made up of only 25 words. So how do we deal with this when we are creating our A to J guided interviews? First, you write for your audience. Consider their age, education, culture, and language as you script and create the questions. Use familiar words and phrasing. If you have to use specialized terms, explain them. That is what the pop-ups and learn mores are meant for. Avoid foreign, archaic, and noun-heavy phrasing. Use the active voice and direct address. Eliminate surplus words and omit unnecessary detail. Boil the information down to what your reader actually needs to know to complete the form. And aim for a fifth grade reading level. The next five slides are a series of practice exercises. You can see here on the left a list of eight legalese words. I'm going to pause for 10 seconds so that you can translate those words into plain language. If you need more time, feel free to pause this video and resume when you are ready to see my suggestions. Instead of conceal, think about using the word hide or cover up. Instead of consent, try agree, allow, or okay. Instead of enjoined, ordered, or commanded. Instead of expenditures, try costs or expenses. Instead of injunction, try a ban, an order, or a ruling. Instead of a modification, it is a change or an adjustment. 
instead of the parties, try the people involved or you and the person you are suing or you and the person that is suing you. And also shall can become must, will, or going to. Let's try another exercise by making Latin accessible. Again, I will pause for 10 seconds before displaying my suggestions. If you need more time, please pause the video. So let's make Latin accessible. Instead of using EG, spell it out and say, for example. Instead of IE, that is. Instead of the Roman numeral 14, use the number 14. Instead of the phrase in propria persona, say you if you are referring to the pro se litigant. And instead of the phrase subpoena duces tecum, say a court order to come to court with a specific document. This exercise focuses on translating common legal phrases into plain English. I will now pause for 10 seconds before displaying my suggestions. A way to translate at the present time would just be to say now. The effective date of termination of order is the date the order ends. If you set the matter for hearing, you set a hearing date. With regards to is about. A true and correct copy is just a copy. If it isn't true and correct, then it isn't a copy, so you can just say copy. If you found a loophole with which to circumvent the truth, you lied. If you made a statement that, you said. And to supply an explanation that is satisfactory is simply to explain. Let's do one more set of legalese translations. In 10 seconds, I will show you my translation suggestions. Instead of saying appear in person, you could tell someone to come to court. Instead of a dissolution of matrimony, it's a divorce. Instead of each party shall retain records of all expenditures, you could say keep records of all your bills. If someone is not seeking relief, they don't want anything. And an unfavorable decision in your legal matter means you lost. On this final exercise, let's practice using the active voice by reworking these phrases. Again, after 10 seconds, I will show you my suggestions. The enjoinment against canceling, modifying, terminating, assigning any insurance policy becomes you cannot cancel, change, terminate, or assign any insurance policy. Program eligibility determination becomes this will decide if you are eligible for this program. The appeal procedures information is here is how to appeal. An attendance requirement means that you have to show up. And a firearms possession prohibition becomes you cannot have a gun. When working on readability, it is important to remember that shorter isn't always better. The definition of a legal guardian on the top is at a college level. It states that a legal guardian has the authority and duty to care for the personal and property interests of another person. However, by reworking this definition, we can hit a 7th grade reading level. That's much closer than the 13.5 to our 5th grade reading level goal. And it isn't shorter, but it is clearer. A legal guardian acts as a parent for another person. The guardian must care for and make decisions for that person. Give them examples. For example, the guardian must make sure the person is properly fed, clothed, housed, and goes to school. The guardian has the power to make property, medical care, and schooling decisions for that person. This section on order doesn't matter and organize to serve your reader is especially important to remember when you are creating your A to J guide interview. The form doesn't have to dictate how you gather your information from your end user. On the screen on the left, you can see an example of what I mean. 
This is a table of contents from a regulation that tells you how to appeal an administrative action. Put yourself in the role of the pro se appellant. Think about what questions they might have. What information does this rule require? Does this apply to me? Are decisions final? Do I have to file a bond to appeal? Will I get notice that you're reviewing my appeal? Who decides the appeal? Can I get an extension of time? Think of your end user and all of the things that they might be thinking about as they complete the form. Some other tips. Make sure to set aside time to revise and proofread. Avoid throat clearing clauses. You don't need to say that it is important to note that or that it goes without saying that. Just say it. Watch out for nominalizations. Nominalizations are zombie nouns. They suck the life out of adjectives and they cannibalize active verbs. For example, the company was in violation of the statute. Just say, the company violated the statute. Watch your sentence length. Brian Gardner says the maximum should be 20 words. And use names. Use variable macros to add in the names the end user has already given you in the A to J guide interview. So you can ask what is your name, what is the defendant's name, and in the future when you're talking about the appellant or the defendant or the pro se litigant, use the names that they have already given you for those people. Finally, make plain language a part of proofreading. Microsoft Word lets you do a spell check and a grammar check, but it also gives you your readability statistics. If this doesn't automatically display when you do a spell check, you can enable it in the File Options Proofing section, and it will tell you at what reading level your paper is at. And it will also tell you a percentage of sentences that are passive. If you still need help, you can go to plainlanguage.gov or the Center for Plain Language.org, or writeclearly.org. It has a great online plain language gadget, and it also has a Cali lesson written by one of our legal aid attorneys that uses A to J guide interviews on plain language specifically. Thank you for coming today. If you have any questions, feel free to email me.